Clark Porter. Uh, no, uh, I, I'm uh, uh, speaking to you. Yes, yeah, so you. Oh, I see. And I, yeah, oh, sorry, I, 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 I apologize. Yeah. Okay, so uh, mm -hmm. welcome to our seminar. Uh, today we are very happy to have uh, Dima uh, Chowchak from uh, Inas Paris, and uh, he will tell us about the uh, ST embedding and I, uh, icing on the diamond model on panel graphs. Okay, uh, thanks for inviting. And as I already mentioned, I got a permission from the organizers to give a not very formal talk. So the plan is just to explain a general idea uh, behind the construction of s and embeddings of planar graphs. So what are these guys? And uh, okay, in short, those are special embeddings adopted uh, these embeddings are specially adapted to the easing model, and this is a particular case of something adapted to the bipartite dimer model. Certainly, in this seminar, the most intriguing question is whether there is any link with random geometry, whether one can uh, somehow use these embeddings uh, to, I don't know, to get, an in, to get interesting questions in random geometry. And my dream, actually, those are not results, but that's like a dream, uh, is that it should lead to interesting questions. Uh, on this, so there are just about 10 slides. Okay, formally speaking, 12. So the, this is the first, the last is empty, and there are 10 minutes. If you have a question, please pose a question. Uh, I have also slides of other talks that we can use and so on and so forth. Uh, from the very beginning, let me say that though formally these embeddings, at least originally, they, they defined as embeddings in the complex plane. So this could be thought similarly to, for instance, uh, these curved embeddings developed by you guys. Uh, it's much better to think about them as embeddings to Minkowski spaces. Just from this slide, the, from the first from the title slide, just remember the word Minkowski spaces, though it was not there. And here is a big roadmap. And we, the, effectively, the, the plan is simply to go through this roadmap. So what we start with is abstract graphs. And by an abstract graph, I simply mean a graph embedded, say, into the plane or into the sphere up to homeomorphisms. Okay, that's also what people call maps, planar maps. Uh, I'm not going to specify whether I am in a finite or in an infinite setup now. Okay, just a planar graph. And this is a weighted graph, and the weights, uh, they just correspond either to the Eisen model. So if we work with the Eisen model, then this is just whatever graph you can imagine. And uh, if we work with diners, each time I say the word diners in this talk, those are bipartite diners. So the graph is bipartite, and again, this is a weighted graph. Maybe just to fix uh, the terminology and to understand how it works. So that's a standard slide on the Eisen model. So somehow I assume that everybody in the room um, more or less knows what the Eisen model, the planar Eisen model is, and what the bipartite diamond model is. Uh, just to fix the terminology, so in this in case, well, I prefer to assign spins to faces, but there is, there is no difference. Uh, X is just the price for the interaction. So to each edge, the, a constant, a positive constant in between zero and one is assigned. And this is a price uh, to have uh, to have an inter uh, plus and minus disaligned spins across the edge. Okay, and then uh, still, when we are in an abstract setup, what we can do, uh, we can define objects which are called fermionic observables. Uh, okay, say so if we are in the bipartite dimers, then in the bipartite dimers context, there is an object which is called the Castellane matrix. This is simply the, the adjacency matrix, weighted adjacency matrix of your graph with plus minuses put somewhere. And then the harmonic observables, those are just inverse entries of the inverse matrix. Okay. If we are in the easing setup, uh, then basically 
how does this work? What you can do, you can say, oh, la, la, uh, now I'm lost. What you can say, you can use what is called spin disorder formalism. Um, okay. At this point, maybe it's not even necessarily to really understand, I mean, what the disorders are, and I'm going to, I want to save time here. But the point is that, okay, there are observables which are assigned, there are values which are assigned to corners of your graph. So if this was just a graph, I mean, the, the graph, either the original or the dual one, then you can think about functions who are defined in between of vertices and dual vertices at corners. I'm going to come back to, to, to this in, on, on the next slide. Uh, but here the point is that already in the abstract setup, uh, there are observables and they satisfy a simple local relation. And this is a linear relation. Um, yet again, it's, it's easier to think about dimers. So in the dimers, what is the local relation? The local relation is simply that uh, you do the entries of the inverse matrix, then multiplying back by the Castellane, you have some identity. So there is a real value identity. Okay, and here there is an overall idea. So what is an overall idea? How uh, these uh, embeddings will be constructed? you choose a distinguished solution to this relation. Okay, maybe if it is a plane, this is just in the full plane. If it was a finite geometry, then maybe something happens at the boundary. But in the boundary, there's just a, some solution of this abstract uh, linear equation. Or you choose a pair of two real solutions. And then using the solutions, you construct an embedding of your graph or of a dual graph. And as already said, well, originally this is an embedding into the complex plane, but what is important is that it should be viewed, it's much better to view it as an embedding into Minkowski space. And this construction I'm going to explain, obviously. Then it turns out that this linear relation, which lives on an abstract graph, now can be interpreted in terms of your embedding. So and in general, it could be many embeddings. So somehow each such an embedding provides you an, an interpretation. And it could be interpreted as just closeness of some differential piecewise linear differential forms. So F, just think about it as an observable, but now it's complex valued and, uh, and I will explain what happens. T is just an embedding, so say in the diverse context. Here there is yet another symbol, which is O. And this guy, think about it as the second coordinate in this space. So T is just the first coordinate, so this is where your complex plane is. But as I said, it's going to appear a second coordinate, either two-dimensional or one-dimensional, depending on the context. And this O, is simply the second chord. Now, what happens if we imagine a setup of passing to the small mesh size limit? Then what happens is that this, this equation, provided there are subsequential limits of observables, can be interpreted as the massive holomorphicity equation. So what is what here? So psi is more or less that's a subsequential limit of observables. So what I'm saying is that now when the graphs are properly embedded, if there is a limit of observables, then this is something nice. Okay, it will be also a factor, but right now just think about psi as being a limit of f. This is not fully correct, but morally correct. Now, what is zeta? Zeta, now you have, okay, we embedded everything into R2 plus one or R2 plus two, and now this is a surface. And the surface will be space-like surface because of that is just a free remaining manifold. And it can be, it admits conformal parameterizations. So zeta is nothing but the conformal parameterization of this manifold. Uh, okay, so this is a conformal parameterization, but what is important is that this is not really a holomorphicity, a pure holomorphicity equation. This is a massive holomorphicity equation. So this is not like psi is a holomorphic function. 
and M is just the mean curvature of the surface. So somehow the overall picture is the following. So if this procedure gives you a surface in the limit, then this propagation equation appears. But then clearly minimal surfaces play a very special role. So if the mean curvature vanishes, it means that you really see conformal invariance. If the, if the mean curvature does not vanish, then somehow you should not expect the conformal invariance. So that's the roadmap, and the plan is to explain, I mean, the steps. Okay, this is a picture basically that I already showed uh, on the others, I mean, in the, from, in the other presentation, but now handwritten. Uh, so, what are fermionic observables? Just again, yeah, in one more brief recap. So, in this model, okay, if you are familiar with this picture, just okay, sp spend a second on this reminder. If you are not, it's not really relevant. I mean, to 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 a full extent. Okay, it is relevant, but not really necessarily to understand what's going on. Uh, okay, here there are interaction constants. Uh, which are parameterized in this way. If you are familiar, say, with the isoidal co context, then uh, theta in that con uh, context have uh, geometric meaning. Uh, but for me, this is simply an abstract parameterization. Uh, say again? No, I wouldn't say so, Andrea. For an isometric embedding, no, not at all, not at all. There is no isometry. I do not consider any metric on the original graph. Thanks for asking. No, this is just, I don't know, topological embedding, if you wish. Okay, and here there is a formalism you can play with, uh, with uh, spins and there are dual variables, which are called disorders. And actually, this formalism does not require to fix an embedding. This is purely combinatorial. Uh, some of you are probably familiar with Smirnov's interpretation of these observables, and uh, in that interpretation you start with a geometry, but the point is that it's not necessary. So these observables, they always do. And for dimers, if there is a bipartite graph, uh, then you can simply play with, with the Castellane matrix, and uh, these observables are functions on either black or white vertices that locally belong to the, uh, to the kernel. By locally, I mean that, okay, if you apply K uh, to this vector, then, uh, okay, almost, almost, all, almost all the results are uh, zeros. And there is a link. So actually, as embeddings is a particular case of, of a T embedding. And the link is as follows. Given an easy graph, uh, what you can construct, what you can do, you can construct an associated bipartite graph like that, weighted bipartite graph like that. And then it so happens that the linear equation for fermionic observables on the left, uh, which is here, becomes just the condition that uh, X is in the kernel of the, of the Castellane matrix. Long story short. Uh, if you are better familiar with the subject, then there is a small, there is a certain trap. So here, these observables are actually defined on the double cover of this graph. So to make a link, you should choose a section of this double cover. But this choosing of the section corresponds to the choice of the Castellane signs uh, on the right. Uh, but yet again, you can consider this as a technical. So I'm just saying that, OK, maybe the bipartite uh, dimer setup is easier to understand. And OK, well, let us think about that. So this is, lo this is about local relations. And now I'm going to explain what is a team baden of a graph. And by the way, so this, this terminology is used in our paper and in our paper in, in preparation with Benoit Ali and Maria Naruski and Mariana, as far as I understand, is in the room, so uh, she can comment as well. Uh, but actually, exactly the same notion appeared even before in the paper by the Kenyan, Bain Lam, Sanjay Ramasami, and Mariana again. Uh, so there it is called Coulomb gauges, and this is fully equivalent, just to say okay, that this is simply the same thing. 
just so happened that it appeared in two independent projects and different names. Okay, so we are given a bipartite weighted bipartite graph. And what we will do, we will embed the dual of this graph into the plane. So what are the rules of the game? The first rule is that the length of these edges should be gauge equivalent to given dimer weights. So what does it mean to be gauge equivalent? So here is uh, the signed Castellane matrix. So it encodes the dimer weights. What you can do for free, you can multiply these uh, this matrix, these weights effectively, uh, by something which depends only on the black vertex or only on the white vertex. This doesn't change the law. So, so such, such a multiplication doesn't change the law of the Daimler model. And because of that, uh, somehow you don't distinguish. I mean, the, the only meaningful object is the collection of weights considered up to the gauge equivalence. Okay, so uh, this is the first condition that the lengths are just gauge equivalent to to the to given dimer weights, and the second condition is that angles are balanced, um, at least in inner at inner vertices. So here, just the sum of two black angles is pi, and so is the sum of two whites. Uh, here is the sum of three black angles pi is pi, and so on so forth. So just a condition. And uh, on the level, uh, remember that I said that this team bedding can be constructed out of special solutions, out of special observables, if you wish. So how this work, effectively this gauge, I mean, that, that's a fully equivalent description of the picture on the left. This gauge is chosen itself to be a complex valid solution to these equations. Right, so somehow you can think that itself, this is an observable. And if you choose this gauge, so that's why the name gauge is here and embedding is there. So, and if you choose this gauge to be the kernel and simply define your embedding just by saying that, okay, this is now is a complex number, is just, is just the new, the new key, then the condition to be in the kernel guarantees that, okay, you define the, these increments, but it closes along vert, uh, around vertices. And uh, well, the, that's exactly the construction and the, angles can, the angle condition is effectively the Castellan side condition. So, okay, th this picture can be viewed two ways. Either you, we construct a gauge and then embed the graph. I mean, either we, we choose a fine uh, special special solutions, apply this gauge transform and construct an embedding, or maybe we simply start with this geometric picture. The point is that these geometric pictures are flexible enough to include every diner model. That's the point. Okay. And now, Okay, what are S embeddings? Uh, well, some of you might be familiar with the context of the critical Lisian model. So the, the simplest example is simply the square grid. Then there is something which is called isoradial graphs, critical Lisian model on isoradial graphs. And in the representation, when you draw both the original graph and the dual one, what you get is rhombi. This is known under the name of rhombic lattice. Then actually recently, certain generalization of, of this construction appeared, was suggested by Martin Lees, uh, where rhombis are replaced by kites. And this also has links and with circle patterns. Actually, as embeddings is uh, even further generalization when what you consider is just tangential quads. So this is a tiling of a plane by tangential quads. And these quads are not required to be convex. So it can be concave like that. And tangential means that four lines are tangent to the circle or just this plus that, I mean, or just the sum of two opposite sides of lines so of the lines of opposite sides is the same here and there. Uh, so this is a definition, and at this point, what I want to say is simply that it is coherent with the correspondence I mentioned before. 
So somehow, if you don't want to think about the easy model, then what you can do, you say, okay, I consider an associated dimers model, and then think about embeddings of this dimer model. It's not fully true, because you should choose uh, G, the gauge on black and white vertices uh, in a coherent way, but Roughly, this is true. So this is a particular case. In particular, uh, in particular here, the angles are, are balanced because, uh, for instance, this is a uh, bisector, okay, not very straight, of this angle. So around these vertices, the balance condition is a triviality. They just equal to each other. And here, this is equivalent to say that the quad is tangential. So, okay, here is, is a picture and again, it pops up as a result of a choice of a special observable on an abstract graph. Okay, and now uh, the key definition. What is the origami map? Up to that point, we just embedded our graphs into the plane. And now what I want to say, I want to say the following. So imagine now, say on this picture, I start folding my plane along every edge of my bed. Then this procedure is locally consistent. Uh, why? Simply because of the angle condition. If you ever think, well, what is a local condition around the vertex? That, okay, this folding is possible. Then, uh, okay, that's simply that the angles are balanced. So if you, so you can interpret this procedure as constructing a mapping from this plane to another complex plane. So this or a mapping from the original graph to another com complex plane this is just the second component. Well, uh, maybe it's useful, I don't know, at least time to time <laughs> when speaking about that, we find useful to give a one-dimensional analogy. So in the one-dimensional analogy, what you have is simply a tiling of a play of a line uh, by black and white segments. So this is a triviality. Then when you start folding, what you have is just a piecewise linear function like that. Okay, this is origami map in one plus one. So somehow what, what I pretend is that now you can do the same in over in the plane and this is this will be R2 plus two in general. And what is important uh, or at least peculiar is that in the easing case, actually when you do this folds in all the uh, thick edges, all the edges of the original quadrangulation, they're folded over each other because of this bisector condition. So what happens is that actually here, the second component is two plus one. So here we construct just, so think about this as an embedding of the original graph who lived maybe here Right, it is now embedded into R one plus one. So in general, for its embeddings, we have R two plus two, and in this in case, we have R two plus one because of the additional degeneracy. And coming back to say well-studied context of isoradial graphs, and also the, this is okay isoradial rhombic lattices. The, the procedure is trivial. So somehow what you do, you simply oscillate between, when you go along this point, around these points, you oscillate between plus delta over two and minus delta over two. So this embedding is really flat. So that's why you do not see all this geometry in the isoradial case. This is very, very uh, special example. If you wish. And the last comment on this slide is that trivially when uh, you follow the plane, you cannot increase distances. And typically what you should expect is that you decrease distances. Say on isoradial case, you decrease them drastically, almost to zero. So this means that if I 
think about the space naught as R about uh, R four, but R two plus two uh, is about is a Minkowski space. Then the surfaces are space like. It's just a comment. So now this is a construction. We started with a graph and we embedded it by, by choosing special solutions to, to the Minkowski space. And of course, the question is, what is it good for, right? At this point, it looks a bit artificial. So the question is, what is it good for? Okay, now what we should do according to the plan, we should reinterpret uh, the fermion observables who live on an abstract graph using this embedding. So we should somehow understand what type of equations, I mean, to, to, to what the original equation, which was a very simple one, translates in this language. And again, in the general context, what are reasonable observables, what we're interested in? Well, basically those are inverses of the Castellane matrix. And remember, the original Castellane matrix was real. It means that these quantities, they have a prescribed complex phase, prescribed complex sign. So a natural class of functions to consider, say, defined on black, on black vertices or now faces, is just functions whose values have a prescribed complex sign. And this complex sign comes from the gauge. And they satisfy this equation locally. And then there is, so I for simplicity, uh, I assume that T is a triangulation. There are some modifications to make uh, in the general case and I'm not going to discuss them. And then there is a lemma, here it is, which says that this condition can be rewritten in the following way. So instead of playing with these values on black triangles, who are essentially real, by saying essentially real, I mean that we know what is the complex sign. Uh, you can introduce complex values, but on white triangles, such that those original ones are obtained as projections of these complex values onto prescribed directions. Okay, it cannot be deep consideration, right? If you already know this statement, it should be straightforward to prove. Right here, it was a, it was a real linear relation. And this, if you think for a while, this is also a real, a real linear relation because there are two degrees of freedom here and we should match three projections. Uh, the point is that this is the same. And for those of you who are familiar with the easing context, I want to indicate that this is pretty much the same as Stas definition of s holomorphic functions on say the square grid or on isoradial graphs that we worked with some time ago. Uh, so there are complex values whose projections match effectively. That, that, that's the message. So this is this indeed this, this is a generalization. So I mean, all links that I mentioned, and they, they turns out, turn out to be consistent with each other. Okay, and now this is still where we continue reinterpreting uh, these equations. So what happens? Here we had real valued functions, then we have chosen an, a special solution, constructed an embedding, and we got C valued functions. And then one can go further and to say that uh, these projections conditions can be further written as uh, the closeness condition for certain differential forms, piecewise linear uh, constant differential forms, like that. Where T, yet again, T is just the first coordinate and O is the second coordinate of the embedded into the complex space into the Minkowski space. Uh, what is below is of less importance, but uh, let me just mention it. If one works with diners, then eventually at the end of the day, you are interested in correlations of the height function. 
And these correlations, they, in this formalism, they have a form of linear combinations of such, of such primitives, and this, this integration should be making each of the, of the positions um, under consideration. Uh, but this is a simple fact. If these forms are closed, then these forms are also closed. And in the Asian context, uh, there is an object which, I mean, to, to, to each um, easing observable, one associates um, classically due to stars the primitive of F squared dz, and it admits a generalization. So that's like the, the, the standard picture lifts onto this format. Okay. So far, so good. Are there any questions? I believe that's a good point uh, to wonder about questions. So we start with abstract solutions by choosing an embedding, by choosing a special distinguished solution. We have an interpretation of every other solution in this room. Okay, good. Uh, now there is a question. So eventually we want to pass to the limit with these observables. And for that, you need a certain a priori regularity theory. So somehow you want to take subsequential limits and you want to know uh, under which conditions you, you are allowed to do so. Under which conditions there are no local exponential blow-ups in a sense. And here is a slide devoted to these conditions. So the first condition, this assumption, of Lipschitzness is something very, very natural. And uh, okay, let me emphasize that at this point, we do not have any notion of a scale of a concrete embedding. So in traditional setups, this is a lattice and there is a mesh size, but now that's something really very flexible. And the first condition actually, in a sense, defines such a scale. And this is the scale above which the origami this process of folding becomes quanti uh, quantitatively Lipschitz. Right, so it is always here, one can always put one, but okay, above a certain scale, we assume that one can put a better constant. And this assumption implies that actually holomorphic functions on, on embeddings, T-holomorphic functions, they're held above this scale. And this is fully general, so you really do not care about the local structure. So the embedding can be as bad as it wishes below scales built. Well, unfortunately, it is not enough. So we need more to develop a reasonable theory, and there is this assumption of X fat. So somehow you, your guys are experts in random maps, and if we try to embed a random map, then we should expect that there are nasty regions, that there are like very bad regions concentrated near points, but not near, near um, curves. So like bad accumulation points. And the condition is as follows. So assume that, imagine that given a triangulation, we remove all triangles that are a bit fat, that contain a tiny, tiny circle inside, tiny, tiny disk, and tiny means exponentially tiny in delta. So this is a really, tiny number. Imagine that we remove such potentially dangerous triangles out of the embed. Then what we require is that simply the size of remaining vertex connected components is small. And there is no need to have a quantitative bound here. So there are just no curves, one dimensional objects composed of, of, uh, of very bad triangles. And this, this assumption actually allows to have a Harnack type control um, of functions in terms of their primitives. Okay, this is technical. I just wanted to indicate that potentially this setup can be, this theory can be applied to embeddings which are very nasty near accumulation points. Certain accumulation points. And what is important is basically here, so it says that, okay, provided we have a certain control of primitives of these functions, and that's what you can gain from the model, uh, then there are subsequent limits because these functions are, are equicontinuous. And then if we also find the subsequent limit of these graphs, 
And this again can be always done by compactness, right? Because R is a Lipschitz function of T. So again, by in whatever reasonable setup, you can find subsequential limits of that kind. Then continuous complex valued functions appear and they satisfy the condition that forms of that kind are closed, differential forms of that kind are closed. Okay. So basically that's the same condition as, as in discrete. And what I said, I said that, okay, there, there is a certain a priori regularity theory developed in this paper, uh, which allows, which guarantees existence of subsequential limits in, in certain circumstances, at least under certain circumstances. But then now we come to the simple geometry. It turns out that actually this condition can be rewritten. So this is now purely in continuum. So we now forget about everything that happened in discrete. The problem is purely continuous, how to treat this condition. And it happens that it admits a fully geometric description. So you take your surface. This is a space-like surface in the Minkowski space. Because of that, it carries a positive Riemannian metric. Because of that, it can be uniformized. Right? Now, OK, it admits a conformal parameterization or isothermal parameterization in geometric terms. That's the same. Then, if you do a simple transform of, of this f, like okay, like it is written, uh, this turns out to be simply equivalent to the massive holomorphistic condition, and m has a perfect geometric meaning. That's the point. It's slightly more complicated in the Daimler's case, but what appears here is a pair of of conjugated equations. So here m uh, is is a real number. Here, as far as I understand, it's not necessarily real, uh, but still it has uh, the absolute value is the absolute value of the mean curvature. Okay, if you think about surfaces of co-dimension two, then the mean curvature is not, not a number but a vector. Anyway, let us not dive into this. But after all that has been said. It's clear that minimal surfaces should play a special role. Because somehow, in many, many questions, what fact is that, that conformal invariance appears at the end of the day? And, uh, uh, well, OK, if in the conformal invariance setup, holomorphic functions should appear. OK, so this is now a geometric perspective on the story of conformal invariance. Questions? Okay. So now let me briefly comment on results that are available around, I mean, in, in this theory. So, what type of theorems can we prove? So the first is uh, about the Eisen model. So what is in the Eisen model? Here, okay, you know, on isoidal grids, for instance, there is a result. Well, due to on Z two, this is due to Smirnov on isoidal grids. This is our joint result with Smirnov. Uh, so there is a result on convergence of curves to SLE interfaces to SLE curves. So it can be generalized to the setup of S embeddings, but at this point under very, very restrictive assumptions. So what are those restrictive assumptions? So you assume that you are in a boundary in a bounded geometry situation. What does it mean? It means that all lengths are comparable to each other, all angles are bounded away from zero, and even the function the origami graph is of size delta. So this is very, very unsatisfactory from the perspective that I described before. Uh, but somehow this already a kind of an interesting development, development because it covers, for instance, all periodic models. So this is a separate algebraic statement that each critical periodic is in model uh, admits an embedding of that kind. And then what you can do, you can do RSW, you can do conversions to SLE curves. 
And here under construction is relaxing assumptions, proving convergence of correlation functions, and uh, actually analyzing massive SLE curves because massive SLE curves, they are not analyzed even in the regular geometry. In the diners context, uh, we have a theorem with uh, Benoit and Mariana, which deals with a very specific setup of perfect embeddings. And maybe the time flies, I'm not going, I will not um, define what perfect embeddings of finite graphs are. Uh, what is important here is that, okay, it works under very mild assumptions on these embeddings and provided, and it really, it, it somehow supports the philosophy that, that, that I described before, is that provided these graphs converge to a minimal surface, the height fluctuations of the Daimler model, they converge to the JFF in the conformal parameterization of the surface. And uh, okay, with Sanjay, we also wrote a kind of a very short paper, an illustration, uh, which says that uh, this is a relevant setup. These minimal surfaces, they do appear, for instance, for elastic diamonds. So, okay, that's about deterministic setups, and I'm not going to comment more. And I plan to spend the remaining three to five minutes okay, maybe five to seven minutes, uh, just trying to see what could be a dream. I mean, what are dreams on critical planar maps equipped here in this model? And this is like, like dreams. Now, what is, what is that about? I apologize, guys. Something's going on. Uh, <coughs> Okay, what's that about? What I said is that, okay, now there is a setup, given just a quenched setup, given a weighted graph, there is a construction of, embed, I mean, there is an embedding of it into Minkowski space, which in a sense reveals the conformal structure, right? So the equation of motion becomes either holomorphicity or massive holomorphicity. And somehow it suggests that if we start with a canonical ensemble of random maps, then canonical fluctuating surfaces should appear. Yet again, maybe the most, okay, most interesting thing is that it should, I mean, one should view the surfaces being embedded into the Minkowski space. And this raises actually infinitely many questions. So one of the questions, okay, what is the law? I mean, is there any way to write, I mean, natural way to write an action or, I mean, is it, well, I mean, is there any way to guess the law? In particular, one can try to follow the, uh, this path. So the partition function of these and model is known to be well, conceptually, okay, when I say it's known to be, it should be thought of as uh, the determinant to some power because this is a fashion of a half of this operator, of the zero operator. Well, now the picture becomes absolutely geometric. So there is a very rough surface. We cannot say, I mean, define its mean curvature directly, but maybe there is a way, I mean, to, to define that, that that's what your expert is in, to define, I mean, to regularize it in a, in a way. And maybe it could be at least a way to speak about the determinants of zero operators. Then one can try to guess. I mean, one, that that's what, what what is written here is just yeah, is just a certain guess, which is most probably not correct. Most probably there are other factors, and maybe that's even doesn't make any sense. As it well, literally, it doesn't make any sense. Maybe one cannot improve this to a good definition. But the question itself. I believe is fully legitimate and more or less, moreover, one can indeed start with the discrete context. So one can start with say graphs with the topology of the sphere, then pick one of the faces, declare it to be an outer face, one of the quads. One start with the quadrangulation and the easy model lives on the half of the vertices. 
and then these perfect embeddings are known to exist. So in discrete, you really have a canonical construction. Well, here, that's the main question. I obviously do not pretend that I have much to say about that. Uh, for me, this is still a dream. Well, here is a reformulation of that question. Could all this story, which somehow I, I said in a quenched way, I mean, just for deterministic graphs, could it be actually beginning, I mean, the, the, this construction, could it be a beginning of another beautiful story? Yeah. That's it. Thanks. Thank you, uh, Dima. So uh, I guess there must be many uh, questions. So maybe I can start by asking one. So uh, uh, can you uh, go to the previous slide? Yeah, sure. Oops. Right, so my understanding is that, uh, so uh, basically for every weighted graph, uh, you can assign some embedding, right? And, uh, and but in, uh, in this uh, picture, so you have this uh, critical planar map weighted by the icing model. And uh, what's the natural weight you want to put on this planar map? Again, what is there? So, so, uh, so uh, um, in my language, so this uh, critical planar map weighted by the icing model, a priori, it uh, doesn't uh, have a weight, right? So basically all the edges should have weight one, right? And are you, I, oh, I, it, I it, 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 wait, uh, no, no. Well, the, to the best of my understanding, it depends. So there are several models, um, several choices of of a model. So, for instance, one can start as the easing graph with a triangulation, and then there is a specific yeah. value. I don't remember what what is there, what is the specific value, uh, which is a double critical point in this case. Uh, but what I somehow what I what I'm saying is the following. So imagine there is a graph with a topology of a sphere, right? So here, this is a, yeah. so how you choose a model that's, okay, for, for this question, it is somehow a pre, prerequisite. So for instance, what, what, what one could try to do, but I'm not certain that it makes sense, is to choose a, a, as a model, just quadrangulations here. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And consider as the easy weight just uh, the self dual value, right? For quads, mm -hmm. this should be the same. I mean, the self dual value, if, if you put it everywhere the same, then this should be like on the square lattice square root two minus one, uh -huh. right? Then what you are doing, you say, okay, here there is, so that, that was a sphere. Here there is an outer quad. So I just declare. That this is an outer quad, right? And then, if you, in terms, say, of the associated dimer model, think about functions uh, that satisfy the equation everywhere except at these two points, except except at these two quads, at this at these two dimer points. Uh, then you exactly have two real solutions. So that's exactly the input. So then, okay, you basically say that if that these two, these two functions uh, produce an embedding, produce an S embedding. Mm -hmm. But as I said, so I am not fully certain that this concrete model uh, is indeed known to converge to, to the LQG when I start with that. But what I want to indicate is that somehow this is irrelevant. You start with your beloved model, which you believe current uh, current the easing, the beloved uh, random planar map coupled with the easing. Uh -huh. uh -huh. uh, and this is fully, uh, I mean, the, the, this, this is fully general. So you pick an outer quad, right? mm -hmm. and that's it. So we can the graph together with its dual. So this is now a quadrangulation, and then you pick another quad, and that's it. Okay. So I guess okay. Uh, my other question is, I think uh, this uh, IC embedding and T embedding they can also be say applied to this uh, UIPT, right? Like uniform triangulation. You can 
also right. inside is embedding, right? And I'm just wondering, so why do you think uh, I think we did map is a better map to study for, for this? Like what other things uh, which is more convenient than study this uh, embedding well, yeah. uh, UIP? <laughs> Yeah, that, 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 that's certainly a good question. So let me try, uh, okay, that, that's certainly a good question, but that's exactly why we're here, I mean, to discuss. Okay. <laughs> uh, well, so these embeddings, uh, remember the, the, the input is like in the plain case, the input is a special solution. And the special solution basically defines the lengths of, of faces in your embedding. So if we go back, I don't know, to, to somewhere to here, right? The length of this of this segment is basically okay, something like something like the product of two special solutions. Or in the easing setup, this is the square of a special solution. Because of that, in the plain case, what you want, you want that such a special solution exists. I mean, the one which does not lead to the exponentially growing, the exponentially fast growing size of faces, right? Imagine you started with the square grid, but outside of criticality. Then you should not expect, I mean, if it's simply super critical or subcritical, you should not expect that there is a meaningful limit, a meaningful surface. Mm -hmm. Right, only in the massive regime. So the massive regime is possible, but in general, okay, it's not. Mm -hmm. So somehow then intuitively your easy model on your infinite graph should be somehow almost tuned to be almost critical. Ideally critical, but that may be almost critical. Well, in general, yes, one can play with this construction with whatever setup of that kind, but somehow why I, why here why then I suggested to to think about uh, this stuff because this is already a natural setup when your model is effectively almost critical when you when on each concrete sample of your graph what you expect is the model itself is in a sense okay critical at large scales okay but but yeah, you you are talking about you're right, one can start with whatever infinite graph. And uh, if there is a, so that, that's a separate, so, so, but by the way, it becomes a separate question like, okay, what makes the model critical? Mm -hmm. uh, ideally, in this easing project, what I would love to have is just a statement that instead of these restrictive assumptions, when you simply as, mm -hmm. assume that the surface is Lipschitz, you simply assume this mm -hmm. leap, where was leap, this above scale delta. What I would love to have is that uh, under the Lipschitzness assumption, uh, there is RSW. Yeah. Uh, I don't know how to prove it at the moment. But that's like an interplay between spectral properties of the operator, of the propagator, and, and geometry. Mm -hmm. and the, the, this, is a, this is open here. But that's a very good question here. I, I like it. I see. Okay, so also uh, about your two assumptions, uh, one is this Lipschitz and the other is this uh, fineness. So you believe that uh, uh, both of these two assumptions are gonna be uh, hold for the uh, graphs like uh, uh, UIPT or like IC. Yeah, that, that's another great question. So somehow uh, let me comment, let me comment more on that. So what I believe uh, is that this Lipschitz assumption is more or less equivalent to RSW. Somehow it's indispensable. So, so, so at least my picture, I mean, my, my I don't know, perspective is to say that, okay, if origami does not decrease distances, it means that we are, I say, on deterministic lattices, it means that we are simply out of criticality. Mm -hmm. And then we should not expect RSW. So that's my perspective, my viewpoint on the Lipschitzness. Mm -hmm. This is technical, and uh, in a sense, I would like, uh, I would be happy to remove it. Mm -hmm. But let us discuss it in more detail. So what, what I want to sell is that it's already weak enough. So yet again, we have a scale of delta, which is now defined as a characteristic scale on which you have RSW. 
-hmm. above which you have RS now. Mm -hmm. Then you fix a parameter and all normal triangles, okay, yet again, this is a tiny number. This is an exponentially small number in delta. Mm -hmm. So you remove this drastic degeneracies. So typically, yet again, all, uh, let me comment more on deterministic lattices, delta is something of the order of the local scale. So something like that. So here you remove drastic degeneracies. And what you want is that, uh, okay, there are no, there is no remaining connected components. It means that, okay, it can be a small region and the size of this region, it can be much bigger than delta. It doesn't matter. The, the only thing is that it, it, it uh, vanishes in the limit. Well, yet again, intuitively for me, it means that it could be like very bad points, but not very bad curves. Say, if you think about pictures, you know better than I do of circle packings of random maps or things like that, it sounds plausible. So, uh, I wouldn't bet my house on this simply because I do not have a house. But... <laughs> okay, but even if I had, I wouldn't bet it. <laughs> I, even if I had, I wouldn't bet it that it holds for random maps. But for me, it sounds plausible. I don't know. So there is a recent work by Asaf Dachmius and Dori, uh, and Guru uh, and Daniel Jerison where they prove regularity results for harmonic functions uh, without any on circle pickings without <laughs> such an assumption. So, okay, maybe it can be removed. I don't know. Uh -huh. So, anyway, we were happy enough uh, to develop a theory uh -huh. under that. Let, let me say it like that. So, okay. so because originally it started with bounded geometry, and bounded geometry uh -huh. obviously has nothing to do with random maps. But for me, the, the, is maybe already not that not that mm -hmm. bad thing. I see. So uh, my last uh, question is, for example, uh, suppose I can prove that uh, the uh, interface of IC model on these graphs uh, converging to uh, CLD3, say, or CLD16 uh, over three. Uh, suppose that uh, that can be proved, then uh, what would be the uh, consequence to your program? Well, here I don't think there will be many consequences. So, okay, uh, the, 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 uh, yeah, the, the, that's a very good good question, and it is about a very uh, okay well known. I mean, very very all very how should I say typical in the sense misunderstanding or something like. That. So what we know is that in the limits, I say, if we believe that there is a setup in which this converges to the LQG, then the CLE floating on top is independent mm -hmm. of, the, of the metric, right? Mm -hmm. So in this setup, they decouple. decouple. Mm -hmm. So to see the metric, what you should study, you should study not the curves, but correlations. Mm -hmm. First curves, they're objects, that they're, they're conformally invariant objects. They do not see mm -hmm. a local scale. So what you actually should study, you should study correlation of fields. And by the way, I should I want to mention that there is uh, a very natural field, which is the energy density field, right? Uh -huh. Energy density field. And this energy density field, how does it look in, I mean, what is the situation in, uh, in the deterministic case? It scales that delta. Right, so what your deterministic, uh, what you have, you have a result of that type. This converges to blah, blah, blah. This delta tends to zero. This is a result due to Clemann and Blair and stuff. And uh, why energy density is nice? Because it can be expressed through fermions. It's much easier than spins. Now, if you want to be random, you should wonder what is a replacement uh, of this delta to minus n. And somehow from this construction of fermionic observables, from this interpretation, what you will see is that effectively the notion of a local scale 
appears. And the result you should expect is like that. So this is the same, but those are local scales. And local scales, they're basically just lengths. Well, provided you are in the criticality, but that's okay, something of that kind. And there's local scale. So now in your picture, you should expect that scales are different from point to point, that the scale varies. And those local scales, well, conceptually, they should be these Louisville factors. Yeah, like the vertex. At least, at least there, but that's a dream. So let me write, write it again. This is a dream. Uh, so I guess, uh, this uh, conjecture should uh, also be true if you uh, consider the spin field, right? Right. I mean, for but that's uh, the, the the problem is that these Louisville factors they are not at all explicit. I would say so. That that's something complicated, right? I mean, because there's a correlation. So of, it's not uh, like the. Okay. Uh -huh. So it's not like of, of vertex operators, right? And this uh -huh. is a correlation of vertex of operators of a certain weight. And to the best of my understanding, even in the case of the energy density, this is a special weight, but not that special. Like, uh -huh. because so of that, it, it indicates that that's, example, a, bit, uh, that's uh, a deep so question. For example, yeah. if n equal to three, you cannot uh, compute the value using the UZZ formula, say? Oh, okay, so that, that, that's no, no, okay. So, so sorry, for, sorry for saying the wrong, wrong, sorry for, uh, for making the wrong statement. Okay, those are explicit in terms of, yeah, very complicated. Okay. <laughs> right, right. I mean, so it's, it's a bit hard to imagine, uh, to imagine a direct proof of that. Okay, how this, I mean. Either there is a special property of this particular correlators. Uh -huh. But say when I tried to, to, to ask people like Antje Kupianin or Vansan Vargas, okay, uh, it seems that it is not known. Or the proof is somewhat implicit. And for spin fields, this, this, is, uh, this is another factor, but I should say that the analysis of spin fields uh, is much, much uh, harder, say, even in the deterministic periodic setup. For energy densities, I would say that this is within reach. For spins, more or less, but the factors are somewhat complicated. So spins is, is a more complicated story. But one should expect that, that such, such local factors appear. So that's why correlations. Okay. You should think about conformally covariant objects and not conformally invariant ones. That's that, that's what I'm trying to say. Okay, so these are all my questions. Thank you. So, are there any questions? Oh, so question two. Yeah. There's a question uh, chatbot. Yeah, there is a good question posed by Andrea. What is the geometric meaning of open renewal transform in this context? Uh, I do not, personally myself, I do not have a specific answer. I believe, Andrea, that best people to want, I mean, to ask uh, maybe Nicolas Saforter or Sanjay Ramasani or Okay, maybe Mariana, I don't know, Mariana is here, maybe she can comment on that. Um, there is a mystery around all that. So we really miss, I would say that at this point, we st we're still missing a discrete differential geometry interpretation of this construction. In particular, uh, the appearance of these minimal surfaces Say, coming back to diners, right? We do know that there is this prediction by, by Kenyon and Nokonikov that Gaussian fluctuations should appear in general in, 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 in the limb. But implicitly, it means that the surfaces must appear to be minimal. 
the curves. Otherwise, there is no reason that there is Gaussian structure of fluctuations. If your bosonized massive fermions, you should not expect that this that this leads to free bosons, at least as far as I understand. So somehow it says that okay, this this should be a minimal surface. On the other hand, uh, in examples, this is indeed the case. On the other hand, for irregular graphs, you should not probably expect that this is a minimal surface because the construction is very flexible. So my current perspective, but that's very vague, is that just the condition that there is an additional periodicity, like you're on the square grid or on some nice periodic stuff, this is an additional input to this grid uh, differential geometry perspective. Uh, but that's so weak. And all these questions of combinatorial geometrical type, like the one posed by Andrea Sanks, that's a good question, but yeah, I maybe not the best person to ask here. So yeah, we, we have certain like pre-projects on that, but at the moment it's not at all clear. Still, I mean, yeah, after years, still, still not at all clear. So, uh, hi, I'm, my name is Jayadeva Atray. I'm actually a stranger to this, uh, this subject. I'm not really uh, in this area, but I, I work in flat surfaces. Uh, and, and there we have ideas of what are called origamis, which are um, squares or, or, or parallelograms or parallel sides, a collection of squares or parallelograms where you identify parallel sides to build Riemann surfaces. Um, and of course, you can then uniformize them and think of them in sitting in uh, R2 plus 1 if you want. Um, so I'm curious to see, you know, and of course, you know, if, if there's any connection between the objects you're building and the uh, notions of origamis that we think about in, in, this, in this other kind of world. Uh, it looks like suggestive, but I, I mean, I couldn't see, I, I tried to work out a couple of examples, I couldn't see any direct connection, but it looks kind of suggestive. I, I don't know if you have any thoughts on this. Uh, well, let me give two answers. So the first answer is that, no, I do not have any idea. But the second is actually, uh, is like a direction I would suggest to, to look at. So there is a paper by, uh, this paper by the Kenyan Vane Lam, Sanjay Ramasami and Mariana Ruski. So the paper, okay. the, the paper where the Coulomb gauges um, are introduced. Okay, yeah, I believe you can Google it, I mean, just by yeah. this. Yeah. Okay, so one of the statements in this paper is that if you start with a periodic letter, periodic graph, then uh, what happens is that there is a canonical periodic embedding, and it is actually uh, very much linked with algebraic things like, uh, okay, it, it gives a, it gives rise to cluster algebra and so on and so forth. So somehow once you are in a periodic setup, well, this is a torus. That's not your question. Okay. This is not like general, general, uh, general uh, flat surface okay, as you're asking. But, yeah. But, but uh, yep. Um, I don't know. That's just a suggestion. But let me remind my first, first answer would be no. Okay. Well, I mean, Rick, it's good. It'll be good to look at something of Rick because Rick has thought about at some point in his life translation surfaces as well. So I, I'll take a look at that paper. Thank you for the reference. Yeah, yeah. So, so, so definitely, Rick is in, yeah is again the work of Rick is a much better source of inspiration on this subject. So somehow, somehow, what happened here is that we came to uh, to the same notion from rather different perspectives. So this paper is really of algebraic, algebra geometric. Uh, flavor, and what we thought about here is convergence results, like what type of setup we could have, we, we, we want more, yeah, is enough to prove convergence statements. Well, thank you for a beautiful talk. I mean, like I said, I'm not in this subject, but I really enjoyed the talk. Okay, thanks for saying this. Okay, uh, are there any other questions for the speaker? Um, if not, then uh, so I'll thank uh, 
Dima for a very nice talk. Um, and Dima, thanks for, for coming and giving the talk. Okay, thanks for inviting us again. Yeah. All right. Right. Take care. Yes, yeah. wish. Thank you. Bye.